I'm happy to talk to Bauer a little bit, talk today a little bit about the plant microbiome and uh, its options and the challenges um, linked to use them for more sustainable crop production. But before I go into details, I would like to make you aware that plants are actually indeed colonized by microorganisms. And this happens not only above ground, as you can see here exemplarily from this soybean leaf imprint, where we press a leaf on an agar surface and then let the microbes grow under laboratory conditions, which nicely visualizes that plant leaf surfaces are colonized by microorganisms. This likewise happens underground to the roots. And uh, this is exemplified here by showing you a rice root, um, which has been inoculated with the microbial strain that carries the green fluorescence label, which allows us to visualize it more easily under a fluorescence microscope. And you see here in red, the structure of the root, a lateral root is emerging. And in green, you see the individual bacterial cells, not so clearly the individual ones, but you see that this root surface is colonized, in particular at the location of this lateral root emergence with bacterial cells. So be aware, plants are colonized by microbes above ground, below ground, but not only outside as epiphytes, but also inside as endophytes. So this can be seen here um, with an electron microscopic image of the leaf surface. You have here a stomatal opening, which allows gas exchange. And when you look more closely inside, you maybe have the chance to see that um, there are some bacterial cells inside this opening. This is not the standard for all stomatal openings, but from time to time, you may be lucky to observe it. And it nicely illustrates that microbes have the chance to enter a plant and live as endophyte inside. And together, these microbes with the plant call, um, create what we call nowadays quite often the plant holobiot. So the plant is not alone, it's a group in association with different microorganisms. And this phenomenon that the plant somehow provides a habitat for microorganisms is extended even further, in particular in the soil. Um, when you have done some weeding in your garden, and you have pulled out some plants, you might have realized that you always have more or less soil attached to the roots. And this is not by chance. This is the result of consequences of interactions between plant roots and soil. Um, so the plant is modifying the soil in chemical, physical, and biological terms leading to the creation of what we call the rhizosphere. This is the consequence of the fact primarily that the plant is um, releasing rhizotepacids, so organic carbon compounds, into the surrounding soil, not necessarily in the first instance to attract microorganisms, but this can also be a purpose. Other purposes are that it helps to acquire nutrients or that this is done to protect in particular the root tips um, while growing into the soil from mechanical stress or from water deficiency. So different reasons for the plant to do this, this attracts microorganisms. So nowadays we know quite well and we have tools that allow us to identify quite rapidly what kind of microbes we find in association with plants. We know that the rhizosphere hosts a somewhat different microbial community compared to the soil that is unaffected by the plant root. We know that this bacterial community composition somewhat differs between rhizosphere, so outside, and the root endophytes. There are also some differences between root endophytes and leaf endophytes, and the leaf surface, again, looks a little bit different in its composition compared to the leaf endosphere and to the root. So all these different plant compartments have somewhat different microbial communities. And altogether, these microbes is what we refer to the plant microbiome. It covers the identity of the microorganisms and addition the properties that these microorganisms have, which are defined by their genome. So that's the famous plant microbiome. And what does this microbiome do to the plant? That's actually the interesting question. Sometimes we can see what the consequences of microbial colonization. But if you remember the leap I showed you at the very beginning, there was no evidence by naked eye that there are microbes. Visible consequences can be seen here on the left hand, for example. We may have roots that form these little nodules, or on the right hand side, you see a tree trunk which 
substantially thickened um, base. But seeing these phenomena does not yet tell us is this something that is good for the plant or is it bad for the plant? Is it beneficial or rather detrimental? For the examples I have chosen here, it's pretty much known what's behind it. On the left hand side, you see a soybean plant that is colonized by a nitrogen fixing bacterium that is so responsible in helping the plant to acquire nitrogen from the atmosphere. On the right hand side, you see a rather detrimental association, an oak tree that has been infected with Agrobacterium tumefaciens. So meaning the phenotype may indicate if we know um, what's ongoing that there are microbes present and we may be able to conclude what these microbes are doing. But that's only part of it. So part of the microbes are rather mutualistic, providing benefits for the plants, and some others are parasitic, providing disadvantages. But we have this quite high number of microorganisms that we see and for which we do not necessarily know what they are doing. Currently, we consider them primarily to be commensals, meaning they are living on the plant, they are profiting, for example, from the carbon in the rhizosphere, but without any obvious benefit or harm to the plant. However, there may be further associations and further important functions of these microbes we are not fully aware of. And um, this holds potential in the future to maybe use these microbes for improved crop production. So the research questions or the questions we need to address is, um, what is the relevance of all these different microbes for the plant? Which of the members we see may have additional and further positive effects on a plant, or which ones may have more negative effects? And what are the underlying mechanisms how these microbes may improve plant growth and development? And another question that is important in this context, which factors determine the microbial colonization of the plant? How can we hopefully possibly um, manage plant cultivation in a way that we make more benefit from potential beneficial microorganisms? These are the driving questions, but I would like to start to illustrate a little bit more um, about the mechanisms. And one mechanism you have already seen, one beneficial microorganism um, that is associated with the colonization by nitrogen fixing bacteria. This is nothing that, uh, that a broad range of plants um, is capable to do. This is primarily a trait of, trait of legume plants um, that are colonized and uh, forming nodules in association with these nitrogen fixing bacteria. And this is what we can consider um, an improved nutrient acquisition. So these microbes have a kind of biofertilizer function. Um, there are other less understood strategies, um, but I don't want to go into more detail, um, but rather give you another example of how microbes may affect plant growth and development and improve this. And uh, a classical example is shown here. What you see here is a reddish plant that has been cultivated with Pseudomonas strain in the, or in the presence or absence of a Pseudomonas strain. On the left-hand side, you see a reddish plant in the presence of Pseudomonas and you see its development is advanced compared to the individuum on the right-hand side that has been grown without Pseudomonas. How can this be explained? Um, we know that this specific Pseudomonas strain is capable to produce auxin. Auxin is a plant hormone Hormones in plants regulate growth and development. And if this microbe is producing auxin and releasing it into the environment, this has a consequence that this reddish plant is stimulated in root growth. Having stimulated root growth means that nutrient uptake can occur more efficiently. And this has most likely led to the faster development of um, the plant on the left-hand side. So such a function that microbes produce and release auxin is not only known for this particular Pseudomonas strain, it has been observed in several different plant uh, microorganisms, uh, different species, common rhizosphere colonizers, and it's also not only linked to reddish plants, this trait is seen in microbes um, living in association with different plant species. So we can conclude that different bacterial strains show the potential of hormonal stimulation. And I highlighted here in red potential. 
because although we know quite well that a lot of different rhizosphere and endophytic microorganisms are capable in producing this hormone, we still do not know too well how important this function is under natural and field conditions. Does this play a major role? Is this of minor importance? Do the microbes produce auxin under field condition? This still remains to be clarified in more detail. However, hormonal stimulation of plant growth is not the only aspect. There are more recent research efforts that have shown, for example, that the rhizosphere microbiome via auxin production is also capable to modulate flowering time. Um, so um, the study illustrates um, not only the interaction of the rhizosphere microbiota um, via auxin production, but what it illustrates in this schematic view is that this function in turn is affected or controlled to some extent by the root exudates the plant is releasing into the rhizosphere and the whole process is furthermore modulated by the nutrient availability in the rhizosphere. So this illustrates that these interactions between microbes and plants can be quite complex and really difficult to understand and to unravel. But we can conclude from what I said that microorganisms have the potential to modulate plant growth and development by hormonal interactions. So that's the second mechanism. I would like to mention a third mechanism and that is related to um, plant protection against pathogens. And here I would like to give the example of the so-called suppressive soils and their secret. And um, the example will be based on a fungal pathogen that is called Geomanomyces graminis. This is a pathogen that induces take all disease in cereals. You can here on the left-hand side see the symptoms within the field. So the plants become rather whitish and uh, growth is stunted. If you look in more detail at the plant, you see that the base of the shoots becomes black. The fungal pathogen is affecting the transport of water and nutrients upwards, and this leads to plant disease. Um, it has been observed already in the 60s that, or usually what, uh, let's say it in other words, usually what the farmer is recommended is to perform crop rotation to suppress disease development. Because if you change the crop season by season, you um, uh, prevent that the pathogens can grow to too high numbers in the field because they use their host. So, but what has been interestingly, what has been observed in the context of this um, disease is that in some fields, you also see if you do mono succession, so always planting the same crop, you first see an increase in disease severity, but after some years, you may observe a decline again. And this decline can be quite substantial. However, usually the level, the yield level of healthy plants is not achieved. So it will not solve the problem completely. But interestingly, the disease symptoms go down after a while. And uh, researchers in Rottermstedt have observed this phenomenon. And the question was, of course, what's the underlying mechanism? This is not so easy to answer, actually. Um, this um, mechanism, or this, this phenomenon has been observed in the, in the 60s of the last century, but then it took roughly 25 years to unravel the underlying mechanism. Don't want to go into all the details that I have listed here. So it just illustrates that a lot of different experiments are necessary to understand this. And the final proof or the final understanding, or the final experiments led to, 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 to the understanding that what's ongoing is that um, the wheat plants support the growth of pseudomonas in the rhizosphere. Pseudomonas can produce antibiotic compounds that are released, and these antibiotic compounds inhibit the growth of the fungal pathogen in the rhizosphere. So this was one of the first examples. Nowadays, we also know in this context that there are different bacterial strains present in the rhizosphere that can um, lead to a protective or can um, give a protective function to plants. Um, different plants, uh, different bacterial species are known and different antibiotic compounds are known to provide this, um, by what we call biocontrol function. And the production of antibiotics is just one mechanism. There are other mechanisms also known. Meanwhile, um, 
by which microorganisms can protect plants against pathogen infection. And the fourth example um, I will shortly mention here is that microorganisms are also known to help the plants to overcome stress situations, so to improve stress resistance. So we have apparently different strategies, different mechanisms, how microbes can help plants to develop um, as good as possible. And everything I told you now, or many aspects I told you now are not that new. There is tremendous literature outside that is documenting and reporting these mechanisms and different bacterial strains that are capable of doing so. Leading to the question, well, if we know all these things, can't we make use of it? Of course we can, and we actually do. So there are a couple of commercial products out that use bacteria to implant, improve plant growth and development. I list a few here um, that are involved in, in, in biocontrol functions. There are others, um, and the classical example is that we indeed apply nitrogen-fixing bacteria to legume plants to profit from nitrogen fixation. So in principle, it works, but however, most farmers still use chemical compounds, mineral fertilizers, organic fertilizers, rather than making use of bacteria. So it seems not to be that easy. And I have to admit, it is not that easy. Um, all the different strategies and mechanisms we have observed in the lab can be very difficult and challenging to transfer to field conditions. Or let's say it in other words, the hard way from the lab to the field. We may see very nice protective effects, growth promoting effects under laboratory conditions, once we go to the greenhouse, we already lose some of these functions. If you go to the field, we may lose even more of these functions. We also have understood to some extent uh, why this is so difficult. Because you have to imagine that we introduce maybe specific microorganisms in a field where we already have a natural microbiome. So the microbe may not be capable to survive the field conditions. Maybe it's not the proper pH. Maybe it's not the proper temperature. It may not be competitive with the microbes that are already out there, or microbes also regulate their functions. They do not realize the function if it's not needed. So the protective function may not be necessary for a microorganism under the given conditions, and it's not realized, and the plant is losing um, um, this protection or this benefit. Um, it may also happen that the active compounds that are produced by the microbes and released that help the plants to grow are actually degraded by other microorganisms in soil. And last reason, a technical one I can mention here is that maybe we have identified a nice microbe in the laboratory, which we can handle in the laboratory, but it's, it is really difficult to be handled when it comes to large scale production or which has a uh, which has a very short shelf life. So we, of course, if you want to bring these microbes to the farmers, we have to prepare them in a way that the farmer can apply them days or maybe even, or better, even weeks later, and that they remain active. So this also can limit the application. Well, that doesn't mean um, that we shouldn't become creative and think about how can we overcome these possible limitations? What can we do to use microbes nevertheless and make use better use of beneficial microbes. And this is the last part of my presentation where I would like to highlight strategies and ideas what we may be able to do to make better use of microbes in the future. And uh, it's uh, currently a very hot topic. Um, there are lots of interests of different companies. You see startups everywhere that now try to think about ideas, strategies, how we may be able to use microbes to come to more sustainable crop production. But what does it need to improve? On the one hand, we may think about better application strategies. So strategies to, to improve the survival, the competitiveness of the microbes we apply. We may also think about using more locally adapted microorganisms. For many chemicals, it doesn't matter if you apply them in the tropics or in temperate regions. They, 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 if they are temperature stable, they perform. Microbes may be a little bit more sensitive and we may think about using microbes here in this region that are somewhat different from the microbes we use in other regions. Likewise, as we do with, with, with the crops, we have specifically locally adapted crops that we use. And um, 
This means that we need specific knowledge about the microbial strains that we want to apply. We need to understand their modes of actions. We need to understand their survival conditions and need to understand um, how they perform in the field and how we can support their survival. Another strategy is that is also very popular these days is that we do not rely anymore on just individual microbial strains, that we, but that we move to consortia. So applying not just one strain, but a mixture. And there was very recently a very nice publication, a meta-analysis that illustrates that there is indeed potential in using consortia. Um, these researchers compiled results from 51 different soil studies and evaluated what is the plant growth promotion effect if I use a single strain in comparison to a consortium, so a mixture of different strains. And indeed, it appears that based on the literature that is already available, that there is a stronger effect, stronger plant growth promoting effect if you use consortia in comparison to single strains. The underlying reasons um, can be different ones. It may be that in the consortium, the strains support each other, help each other to establish in the rhizosphere. But of course, we probably also introduce then bacterial strains with different mechanisms to improve plant growth and development. So um, different strategies may apply here, leading to an overall slightly improved performance of the consortium. The researchers also looked into environmental factors that may um, control and affect the effectiveness of these single strains on consortia, looking specifically at different soil traits, such as soil pH, organic matter content, the proportion of clay or available nutrients here illustrated is available P. And look, to, does the performance of the strain in, in the different studies somehow relate to these soil traits? What can be seen is a slightly better performance in soils that have a rather neutral pH value. This is not that surprising um, because microbes also have their preferential pH at which they grow and perform. And many isolates actually have their optimum and best um, growth at neutral pH soils. So if you apply them in soils with near neutral pH, then it's likely that they perform best under these conditions. Interestingly, there is a little bit of evidence here in this plot um, where performance is related to organic matters that we also have increased performance of the strains um, is increasing organic matter. Of course, we only have a very few data points here. It's a very high content. Um, these are also not very common for most agricultural soils, and it needs a closer look here in the future. But at least there is some trend um, detectable. Likewise, here for the nutrients, this plot also suggests at least that with increased nutrient content, there may be a better performance of these strains. And that means that if we want to apply microbial strains as individual strains or consortia, we may have to think about the soil conditions and about um, ideas, options to change crop management in a way that um, the environmental conditions for the microbes become more supportive. Um, that indeed crop management can have an effect on rhizosphere microorganisms and on beneficial trait um, was lately shown in a study which I would also like to highlight in this context, um, where people did um, compare different crop rotation regimes. So one field was cultivated, or three plots within a field were cultivated with peanut plants under monoculture conditions. So every season peanut plant and in a comparative plots they cultivated peanut um, in a crop rotation with mice and potato. After four years, samples were taken from all of these plots, transferred to, to the greenhouse to perform a pot experiment, again, with um, peanut plants. So you see here the three field plots and each, whoops, sorry, each plot, uh, each sam the sample from each plot was used to prepare five um, pots with um, Peanut plants, these plants were grown. And first thing you do is you quantify and you document the plant performance. And not highly surprisingly, the monoculture plots uh, or the soil from the monoculture plots um, showed a slightly weaker grow. 
and performance of the plants compared to the plants that grew in soil that underwent um, crop rotation. Well, this is not very new. This has been um, known since a while that crop rotation is, of course, advantages for plant performance. But these researchers went one step further. They looked into the rhizosphere microbiome. So here we didn't don't discuss the application of specific uh, strains or consortia, but they looked into the natural occurring microbiome, rhizosphere microbiome. And what they observed is on the one hand that under crop rotation, here the bars on the right hand side, um, the rhizosphere microbiome was slightly more diverse compared to the rhizosphere microbiome um, in the peanut plants that were grown in the soils from the monocropping regime. More diverse means more different species. And um, interestingly, this came along with a higher abundance of different genes um, that are potentially involved also in um, mediating um, plant growth promotion, biocontrol functions in the rhizosphere microbiome. For example, you see here phosphate solubilization as one function, a group or one category um, where genes fall into. We have genes that fall into the category of nitrogen metabolism, also related to nutrient cycling in the rhizosphere. A few genes are involved in antimicrobial compound production that may be a hint for improved biocontrol functions. And here at the bottom, we have the increased abundance of genes that are involved in indole 3 acetic acid biosynthesis that's basically auxin production, so plant hormone production. The presence of these genes does not necessarily imply that all these functions are realized, but at least it illustrates that the potential of the rhizosphere microbiome under crop rotation conditions um, to promote plant growth and development appears to be higher. So meaning with crop management regimes, we may also be able to get improved supportive conditions for beneficial microorganisms. That of course means that we need to understand the relationships between survival and activity of microorganisms in the rhizosphere, in the endosphere, in dependence on cropping practices. And I would like to point out that agricultural management is not the only influence factor for plant associated microorganisms. The soil characteristics play a role. The plant root exudates that the plant is releasing into the rhizosphere will largely determine how a rhizosphere root microbiome looks like. This is directly and indirectly via the plant influenced by environmental factors. And the plant genotype, the plant species itself plays a role. What is lately discussed is that possibly also plant domestication. And this these aspects, in particular, the influence of environmental factors of rhizodeposition, this is something um, where we are interested in, in my group, what we address in part in PhenoRob, where we look at implications of possible agricultural management strategies for the assembly and development of the rhizosphere microbiome. But let's go back to plant genotype, plant domestication. This leads me to the last aspect about potential future actions we may take to improve um, the function of beneficial microorganisms. It is assumed that during breeding of the last um, decades, um, breeders have mostly, of course, looked at yield and uh, to, to obtain healthy plants, but not very specifically at uh, the associations with microorganisms. That didn't play a role at very well fertilized soils. Usually, um, you plants do not rely that much on microorganisms that, that it's important to look at it. But however, if we want to make more use, we need to understand whether plants have genomic traits that are related to the requirement and support of specific beneficial microorganisms. And if so, then we may in the future pay attention during breeding not to lose these traits, or in other words, to introduce these traits again, that the plant itself can help in the recruitment of beneficial microbes that promote their development or protect their health. And the last aspect I would like to mention here in this context is that we over thinking all about um, using microbes for um, improving plant growth and development. We should not um, overlook that we may at least spend some thoughts on 
does it come along also with certain risks we should have in mind? What happens if we introduce numerous microbes into an ecosystem? Do we change the ecosystem over time? And I don't want to say that there is necessarily a risk, but we should think about it. We should think about what happens if microbes produce, or if we trigger microbes to produce more antibiotics in the rhizosphere. Can this also have disadvantages? This is something we should keep in mind. And with this, I'm already at the end of my presentation and would like to summarize and highlight the take home message, which you hopefully got. First point, I hope I could convince you that plants are not sterile, but that they are consistently colonized by microorganisms, creating together with the plant what we call the plant holobiont. The majority of these microorganisms are not detrimental to the plant. Um, some of them at least are known to be beneficial. There is potential for even more beneficial strains, which we need to uncover. These beneficial associations can be related to nutrient acquisition, to growth and development, to pathogen defense, or to stress reduction. There may be further mechanisms we are not yet aware of. This also deserves future studies. However, we are already using some of these microorganisms with positive influences on the plant in crop production. Um, there is potential, I think, to improve this, for example, using complex mixtures, or even think about how we can manage the natural microbiome in a way that it provides more advantages to plant growth. And um, this may, for example, come with altered crop management strategies or breeding different plant varieties. And with this, I'm at the end. I thank you for your attention, and I'm open and happy to take your questions. <laughs>